All right, so I'll, uh, I'll begin with a word of prayer. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you uh, again for these students. Thank you for this time we have just to meet together and study your creation a little bit more. Thank you for the weekend, which is about to start. I just ask you to bless this class, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, so today <clears throat> I'm going to tell you about a little bit more about arc length. But more importantly, the Fernet Serret apparatus. Or you could call it the Fernet Serret uh, uh, frame. All right, so. <clears throat> Uh, and we'll be studying in a uh, one particular example as I develop the theory today. So I'm, I'm going to more or less to stick with this one example. And so let's get started on that example. So suppose you have a curve parametrized as follows. R of t is equal to um, r cosine t, r sine t, and um, mt. Let's see here. Here. Let's suppose t is greater than or equal to 0. That's not absolutely necessary, but uh, just for the sake of visualization. Uh, r greater than 0, m greater than 0. Okay. Although I suppose we'll allow r to be 0 or m to be 0 at some point. But just I'm mostly thinking of them as being non-zero. So first order of business, let's calculate the arc length function for this curve. What's the arc length function for this curve? How do I find that? What do I need to calculate? The speed, right? I need to calculate the magnitude of the velocity. So r prime of t is what? Minus r sine t, r cosine t, m. So there's your velocity vector. And so you can calculate the magnitude of this. Magnitude of r prime of t is what? Square root of what? Well, let's see here. r squared sine squared t plus r squared cosine squared t plus m squared. <coughs> so this, does this simplify? Indeed, yeah, this is just the square root of r squared plus m squared. So the arc length function here based at 0, s of t, is the integral from 0 to t of the square root of r squared plus m squared, let's say du. I could use, I, I used tau yesterday. You could, if you want me to put d tau, I could put d tau anyway. It's a, the dummy variable of integration. And uh, so you can do this integral, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not hard to come up with, uh, it's not hard to come up with, um, you know, things you can't integrate, but this is not one of them, I hope. The integral of du is just u, and u evaluated from 0 to t just gives us back t times the constant. So the arc length. Uh, at time t is just t times the square root of r squared plus m squared. This curve has what's called constant speed. It's a constant speed curve. So there you have it. That's the arc length um, as a function of time. So I could I could write this as equal to s if I want to look at it that way, I could. Now, one of the things you can do if you have a curve, right, uh, and if that curve has non-zero velocity all along the curve, it's said to be a regular curve. Let me write that out. Definition. R, let's say from some subset of the reals to, we're mostly thinking about R3, but you could replace this with n is a regular curve if r prime of t is not equal to 0 for all times, for all t in the domain of the curve i. Okay. So 
Sometimes, I, and oftentimes, especially in this course, I'll refer to a regular curve as a non-stop curve. It's a non-stop curve. It's a non-stop curve, right? It doesn't stop. OK? For example, well, my example is a non-stop curve. It has constant speed. In fact, the velocity is never 0. All right? So any non-stop curve, because remember last, yesterday we learned that the arc length is what? For a non-stop curve, it's always increasing, right? which means it's invertible. In other words, I can, I can solve um, for t in terms of the arc length, or I can solve the arc length in terms of t. What I'm really trying to say here is I can, I can take the curve, I can take the parameterization I have, and I can switch it to a so-called arc length parameterization. So I can, I can re-parameterize. We can re-parameterize. a non-stop curve so the new parameter is arc length I think I misspelled that <laughs> there fixed now um, so in this section, I tend to use gamma rather than r for the, the symbol for the path. So let's, let's say that let me, I'm going to use gamma here. I'm going to start using So let's say gamma tilde is the, the arc length parameterization of the curve. I, just, I, need, something, I need some notation um, for the arc length, so I'm going to just use that. So gamma tilde of s here would be what? It's now I'm, I'm thinking about this example. What do I what do? I do? To, to write it in terms of s rather than in terms of t. It's very simple. You just take the arc length function, and you solve for t. I say that's very simple, but in general, that's not something you can do. But for this example, it's something you can do. I mean, you can do it in principle, but in practice, the formula for the arc length may be so complicated, it's hopeless to actually solve for t, even though theoretically it's possible. Obviously, here, it's possible. I just divided. There it is. and so. To the arc length parameterization of this curve, I just replace the t with, the, with s over the square root of blah. So r cosine of s divided by the square root of r squared plus m squared, comma, r sine of s divided by the square root r squared plus m squared, comma, what? Uh, m s divided by the square root of r squared plus m squared. And there you have it. This gamma tilde that I just invented, based on the original curve r of t, Right? It's covering the same set of points in R3, but the parameter's new. It's different, right? The parameter now is arc length. What happens if you calculate the what happens if you calculate gamma tilde prime? What's gamma tilde prime of S equal to now? Let me not do it here. Let me do it up here and let me suggest that we define something for our convenience. I suggest we define, it gets awful old writing the square root of r squared plus m squared everywhere, right? Why don't we just give that thing a name? Let's call it alpha or something. Alpha equals the square root of r squared plus m squared, OK? So then gamma tilde of s is rewritten as what? Actually, should we, I mean, maybe we should even be lazier. Maybe we should put that as 1 over alpha. What do you guys think? Should I make this be alpha, or should maybe I make this be 1 over alpha? Looks like we got 1 over alpha, 1 over alpha, 1 over alpha. Maybe it would be even lazier, even lazier to do this, right? We'd like to be this kind of lazy. So let alpha be 1 over the square root. That would be even easier for the formula. So what, what's the formula become? It becomes what? R cosine of alpha s 
our sine of alpha s. And then what? M, yeah, m alpha s. I mean, if you want what alpha is, alpha is 1 over the speed, right? OK, let's calculate the derivative now. What happens? Minus r alpha sine of alpha s by the chain rule, right? Um, alpha r cosine of alpha s, and then just m alpha. So there's the velocity with respect to arc length, or the derivative of the curve. What's the magnitude? Alpha times the previous thing is true, but of course, just I'm just working out the details. If you'll forgive me. So r squared alpha squared um, plus m squared alpha squared is what it works out to, right? Because you get sine squared plus cosine squared is one, and um, then of course I can factor out an alpha because alpha is what? When can you pull alpha squared out of side of a square root without any kind of further comment? When it's what? When it's a fact, well, it does need to be a factor to factor it out. That is true. Can't argue with that. Constant, what kind of constant? Yes. Positive. Positive. Although I would take non negative. So you're, you, case, you missed one case out of an infinity of cases, but it's okay. <laughs> it's still pretty good. Um, so alpha is what? One over this, right? So this is just equal to? One. OK, so definition, a curve parametrized with respect to arc length is a unit speed curve. You see why? That's a good term, unit speed curve because it has speed 1, all right? Does okay. This, mm -hmm. Does this hold for all curves or only curves that have uh, constant speed? Any curve that has any curve that has is is nonstop. Okay. Any curve that's nonstop allows me to have an invertible arc length function so I can in principle solve for t in terms of s and reparametrize the curve. OK, so I'm going to show you the Frenet apparatus for arc length parameterized curves today. If there's time, probably won't be. We'll, we'll eventually learn how to do what we're doing for a curve which is parameterized with respect to time. But the, um, as a starting point, it's, it's simplest to consider the case that the curve is parameterized with respect to arc length, which isn't, which isn't a big, you know, that's not throwing out a bunch of cases. Most of the curves, in fact, all the curves we're interested in can be so parameterized. So here's the idea. The Frenet frame. So the goal, basically, here is to take some curve and try to study the shape of the curve in terms of calculus. So what would you like to describe about curves? I mean, what are some things that make one curve different from another? Yeah, they, if they have turning points, like how the curve is turning, right? How about if the curve is genuinely three-dimensional? What, what if it's not really a three-dimensional curve? What if it actually lies in some plane? We'd call such a curve a planar curve, right? So we hope what we're doing will detect such features. And in fact, we'll see that it does. So 
let's assume that this is something, let's assume that gamma, and I'm, I don't want to draw tildes and everything, so let's just assume that gamma is uh, unit speed, OK? Um, I guess I probably should put a vector on it since it's a, it's a point in three dimensions, right? So here, basically, I'm drawing do -do 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 -do. Here's a point that's the position vector gamma of s, all right? It turns out that we'll be able to discover the geometry of the curve by attaching to each point to the curve three vectors which are orthonormal, the so-called tangent, normal, and binormal vectors. Let me try to picture them. So the tangent, we've actually already calculated for our example today. So the tangent points in the direction of the curve like so. The normal, it points towards the, uh, if, you, if you fit a circle to the curve, it points towards the center of that, that circle. So if this kind of is bent a little bit like that, the normal would be something like this, n. And then the binormal is going to be perpendicular to both of those. So you take t, you cross into n. And so for, for my picture, the binormal, as I'm picturing it, points into the board. Although I don't seem to have the uh, requisite color. Oh, there it is. So let's see here, I'll try to draw them at another point. Like over here, let's say, suppose that the, 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 the unit tangent's actually in the plane of the board for the sake of discussion. The normal points towards the direction of the circle that you fit to the curve right there. This is the, the normal. And then the binormal here, t cross into n, the binormal would point out of the board as I have it pictured. So our, our goal at the moment is to describe how to uh, calculate this t, n, and b given a unit speed gamma. Okay. So let me give you the definition. T, which is a vector, but I don't usually write vectors over this. It's just one, like, maybe the only place in this course I break from my insistence on writing vectors on vectors. You can, if, it, if it's really troubling to you, you can put vectors on them. But this is the one place where I won't take off points if you don't write vector. <laughs> um, anyway, so this is simply. Uh, gamma prime of s. So by the way, this Tn and B, they form a, an orthonormal frame, like the r hat and theta hat and z hat and rho hat we looked at the other day. It's a triple of vectors of length 1, which are perpendicular to each other and are related by the right-hand rule, so-called so -called, right-handed frame of vectors. Significance of a right-handed frame of vectors is you can you can build any other vector from taking a linear combination of them. Not just that though, you can you can build them in a very nice way, as we'll see. So that's the definition of the unit tangent. So you see, we already calculated the unit tangent to the curve that I started with today. In fact, this right here, see, this right here is t. I mean, technically, it's t of s, all right? There's an s dependence there, but there you go. That's the unit tangent. All right. What's next? We want to describe a normal vector. How do you, how do you get this, this, this normal vector? Let's see here. So, discussion. T dot T is equal to 1. By construction, right? It's, it's, a unit, it's, we, it's a unit speed curve. So, T dot T, in this case, is the velocity squared, but that's 1. So, this is a vector 
with itself that's dot product is one, right? What did we learn yesterday? We can differentiate this, right? So this gives us t prime dot t plus t dot t prime equals to zero, differentiating with respect to s. What does that say? t prime is perpendicular to t, right? Because t prime dot t is 0. So this normal we're looking for geometrically, it's, it's going to be perpendicular to t, right? It looks like t prime is, is a good candidate for this. Now, what's the problem with t prime? It might not have length 1, right? How can we make t prime have length 1? t prime over uh, times 1 over magnitude t prime. Right. So what did, what did Mr. Gibson do there? He just, he just did what? He said n is t prime with a hat, right? It's the unit vector in the direction of t prime. Now, we can be more specific, and I can put the formula which you just told me, which is the magnitude of t prime times t prime. That's the so-called Frenet normal. It will point towards the direction of the osculating, the direction of the center of the osculating circle. The osculating circle is the circle which just fits locally to the curve. It's some, I mean, I won't try to draw it, but. So there you go. That's the definition of the Frenet normal. Now, <clears throat> or just the normal. But I'll say Frenet normal because later in this course, we come across a different notion of normal to a curve, which doesn't necessarily line up with this one. OK? So there's your definition of Frenet normal. Now, <clears throat> at this point, you should recognize that my my starting point for our discussion is not quite reasonable. Or it's too ambitious, let's say. What do we have to throw out if we're going to actually calculate the Frenet normal like that? What, what would be troubling? What if we had t prime was 0? What would t prime be 0 actually mean? So check it out. If t prime is what? t prime is actually what? It's actually gamma prime prime, right? If gamma prime prime is equal to 0, then, the disc then this construction above fails. You can't pick a normal to a curve which has acceleration 0 like that. But can you tell me what kind of curve that is? It's no acceleration, yes, sir? a straight line. Let's not guess that. Let's derive it. Integrate once. What do you get? Constant, Constant vector. Integrate again. Integrate again. You get gamma prime <coughs> is equal to some constant vector times s plus some other constant vector. But of course, um, oops, I said integrate again. Every time we integrate, we remove a derivative, right? So integrating twice gets me to this. But you can recognize that that's exactly the parametrization of a line with you know, direction vector c1 and base point c2. It's a, it's a line. Acceleration 0, if and only if the curve is a line. OK? So that's too simple, or I know it's kind of too easy for what we're doing for this Frenet apparatus, right? We have to throw that case out. That's a special case. So really, we should say gamma is unit speed and nonlinear. So I do, I do need to assume nonlinear in order to do what we're doing. You can talk about lines another day. We, we've already talked about lines. We already stand, understand how they're, we just analyze their geometry. We can tell when they're parallel, when they intersect stuff, blah, 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 blah. So there you got your t. There you got your n. So let's let's calculate n um, for our example. Let me make some space for that. Uh, 
Actually, let me, let me just finish the definition, then I'll, I'll get, I'll get, uh, I'll ca calculate it. And then finally, what's our definition for the binormal? How do you get another vector which is perpendicular and length one to the two perpendicular unit length vectors we have? T cross Everyone says cross product, yes, good. <laughs> so I'm very happy to hear that. <laughs> yes, cross product is a good way to go. And this is a so-called binormal. This is the binormal. All right. Now, so we can calculate then, uh, what's the normal here? What's the normal then? Normal, well, I guess before I calculate the normal, I should calculate T prime. What's T prime? Differentiate this, right? What do you get? Alpha squared, right? What's the derivative of m, m alpha with respect to s? Yeah, it's a constant. That's zero. Yes, thank you. I was about to get really confused about that. <laughs> so you notice here, though, we've got a constant here and here. So I can factor that out. And what I have is I've got r alpha squared times minus cosine alpha s um, minus sine alpha s, 0. My point, I would point out to you that the, the vector I factored out there has length 1. So that has to be the normal. A unit vector in the direction of t prime is what I'm underlining in red right now. Or if you insist, n is equal to t prime divided by the length of t prime, which is, you know, all of this stuff. divided by the length of t prime, which is r alpha squared. So those cancel and give us minus cosine of alpha s, comma minus sine of alpha s, comma 0. That's your normal. Again, the calculation I wrote in red, I didn't really need to do. If you have your wits about you and you understand what's going on with these vector calculations, once you write what I wrote in purple, you can immediately see from that that the unit vector is what we came to. Because you should recognize that if you've got cosine and sine, that's a unit vector, and the thing out front is just the magnitude. Anyway, there it is. So we can calculate the binormal. How will we do that? I guess I can fit it down here. B is t cross n. And so you have a variety. I'll tell you what, I'll use the determinant mnemonic for it. So I've got x hat, y hat, z hat. And let's see here. Um, t was what? Was bit, 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 minus r alpha sine alpha s. And then you got minus r alpha cosine alpha s, z hat uh, m alpha. And then my n was what? Minus cosine alpha s, minus sine alpha. I'm starting to wish I said alpha s was theta or something. That'd be less writing, yeah? So what do we get? Let's see here. The x hat component is going to give me m alpha sine alpha s. The y component um, looks like to me minus three minuses. I think I got a minus here. Minus um, 
Oh, and I think I dropped an R, didn't I? It was MR alpha, is that right? Why do I have M? Oh, no, no, M. I was right before. Let me stick with it. M alpha. Okay, so then R alpha. Oh, sorry. Just a second here. Now, the good news is once we're done with this, we can see if I'm right or not by doing what? Uh, dot, product. dot product, yes. So Z, Z gives you a sine squared and cosine squared. So you just end up with R alpha for the Z. So hopefully that's B. Now we can take the dot product of B with the T in the end. What do we get? Minus sine sine, uh-oh. Uh-huh, let's see here. Oh, this is supposed to have a minus on it. The middle term should have a minus. So then I get minus sine sine, minus cosine cosine. Um, so I get an m r alpha squared. And then I get plus m r alpha squared from the z. And then, yeah, so the dot product of this with t is 0. This dot product with that gives me sine cosine, sine cosine, but with opposite signs, s-i-g-n's. So that's fine. Yeah, this, this is it. To check, we should, we should also have that the magnitude of B is 1, right? What's the magnitude of B? Yeah, M squared, alpha squared, plus r squared alpha squared, which of course we can rewrite as alpha times the square root of m squared plus r squared, which we have seen before, that's 1. All right. So there's the t, the, there's the Frenet frame for, um, for this helix. Now, that alone, I think, is not too interesting. But there's a very specific uh, meaning or what this what, what is the, what is the magnitude of t prime describing, right? So, what is the magnitude of t prime describing, guys? Speed. Um, let's see. Let me rephrase the question. The unit tangent. What can it do? What's its length? One, right? So, if you think about the curve, right? And you think about the unit tangent as you go along, right? By the way, we're calculating a vector field along a curve, right? We're, we're attaching vectors to each point along a curve. I mean, this is a new, new concept in, in principle, right? A vector field along a curve. What's a vector field along a curve? It's a, an attachment of a vector to each point along the curve. So what is, what is t prime describing? It, it can't be describing how the length of t is changing, because the length of t is not changing. It's unit tangent. So what does t prime describe? Yeah, it, it, it describes how the direction of t is changing. And so the magnitude of t prime is actually what's known as the curvature. So the, the curvature um, of the curve <laughs> is the magnitude of t prime. So for our example, we have what? Curvature is what? What was the magnitude of t prime? It was r alpha squared, right? Which is what? So we have calculated the curvature. By the way, what is this curve? I haven't said up till now, but I, maybe you guys already know. It's an spiral. Yeah, it's an upward spiral. This is a helix. So the curvature of a helix is r over m squared plus, plus r squared. Now, 
Now, so, <clears throat> by the way, we have what? So what we have then is dt ds is equal to what? It's equal to the curvature, right, times n. This is one of the fernet ray equations. Fresnay's ray equation number one. <laughs> All right. So once you once you once you see that, you're you're naturally asked. A natural thing to ask is, so if the way t changes along the curve is interesting to describe the curvature, then maybe the way that t n and b all change with respect to each other's changing is a good way to think about the curve, and that actually turns out to be true. So it, what we want to do is, we, we'd like to see how how do T, N, and B change um, as S progresses, right? But in terms of T, N, and B themselves. See, this is such an equation. I have the time rate change of the, the unit tangent is given by the curvature times the normal. So what I'm asking is, what are, what are analogous equations for dnds and, and dbds? OK? And I think I'm going to have to erase my this over here to do that. Okay, so <clears throat> here it is. We're looking for um, dtds, the nds, and the bds equals the stuff. Okay. We already know that dtds is the curvature times n, so we got that one done. And we also have constructed n and t and b so that they're orthonormal, right? So if you think about that, that means I can write this as some, I can pick some constants, right? I can say, well, this is really like, what, like c1 t plus c2 n plus c3 b. There have to be some constants here that you can write this in terms of that because these form a frame. Just like x hat, y hat, z hat, I can express any vector in terms of them. And the same thing for b. So our goal then is to discover what these constants 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 have to be. Right? Now, what do we know about n and b? So my, my first point to you, point number one, is that n dot n is equal to 0. And b dot, oh, equal to 0, listen to me. 1, right? Constant length, 1. And b dot b is equal to 1, right? So what does that say? What does it say about n prime? What does that say about b prime? n prime dot n is equal to 0. b prime dot b is equal to 0, right? By the product rule again. But what are the significance? What are the significance of c1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6? How are those related to dot products? For example, what is c2? c2 is equal to dn ds dot n. Because the dot product of, you know, the dot product of n dot t is zero, b dot t is zero. So when you take the dot product of that equation with n, you're just left with c2. So c2 is the dot product of n prime with n. So what I'm telling you is the fact that their unit length forces immediately 
C2 to be 0. And what else? C6 has to be 0. In other words, these cannot change in their own direction. They have to change in the direction of the other two, the other two normals, the other two uh, tangent vectors, the other two Frenet frames. OK, so then it turns out picking on dBDS is the smartest next move. So my, my second point to you, point number two, to discover, let's see here. So you know, let's look at uh, b dot t. What's b dot t equals to? b dot t is what? And not C4? Because C2 is n prime dot n, which is 0. And C6 is uh, ah, C6 would be you know, B prime dot B, which is 0 by. But if B prime. If b dot t is 0, what's that say about the relation of the derivatives of b and t? If you differentiate this, what do you get? This gives us b prime dot t plus what? Plus b dot t prime is equal to 0 by the product rule. Now, b dot t prime, this is what? B, I mean, excuse me, b prime dot t is what? It's what I've labeled up here as c4. Because if I take the dot product of the third equation here with, with t, it picks off the t component on both sides, which on the right-hand side is just c4. So this is c4. What's b prime dot, what's b dot t prime? What's t prime? Well, t prime is up here. t prime is kappa n. So you have c4 plus b dot kappa n. All is equal to 0, right? But kappa is just a, a scalar function. You can pull it out. What's b dot n by construction? 0. So what's c4 equal to? Right. OK, so c4 is 0. And that leads us to our, our, our final definition for the day. Definition um, d b d s dot n, all right, is well minus that. Sorry, let me write the thing we're defining first. Tau is equal to minus d b uh, d s. Dot n. The minus is just a conventional thing, but there it is. And this is the so-called torsion of the curve. Again, I'm assuming a unit speed parameterization when I write this definition. So the, the third equation then becomes what? It becomes, in view of that definition, the frenet serre equation is just dBDS is equal to minus tau n. OK? The question then remains, of course, how is, what's dNDS equal to? <coughs> see if I have time to work that out. I may not. Yes, sir. Oh, or is that just this? Indeed, we do have time. So how would you figure out dNDS? Ah, curses. Got to erase something here. So what's, what's C, um, let's see here. C1 would be what? C1 would be equal to dNDS dot what? Dot T, right? But let's see here. How can we figure that out? We know that t dot n is equal to 0, right? 
So t prime dot n plus um, t dot n prime is equal to 0. So what was t prime? t prime is kappa n, right? So you can see then that t, pro, t dot n prime, which by the way, of course, is, is, is C1, that's equal to minus kappa. So in fact, um, this, this C1 is just equal to minus kappa. How would you figure out C3? What should C3 be equal to? How do we get, how do we isolate C3 from equation two? Take the dot product with what? How do I select the B component? I take the dot product with B, right? So C3 is dnds dot B, it's n prime dot B. But again, we know that what? We know that n dot b is equal to 0 implies that n prime dot b plus n dot b prime is equal to 0, which tells me that c3 is equal to minus n dot b prime. But b prime is what? b prime is exactly minus tau n and so that works out to tau times n dot n. In other words, it's just the torsion. So C5, excuse me, C3, in fact, is just the torsion. Let me rewrite these. So what we have, what we have just worked out is that the fernet serre equations say that T, that T prime is equal to minus, is equal to kappa N. N prime is equal to minus kappa uh, but of it up t plus the torsion times times b, and finally b prime is equal to minus the torsion times n. So these equations are known as the fernet serre equations, and what they do for you is they completely describe how the fernet frame, the TNB, evolves along the curve just in terms of these two functions, the curvature function and the torsion function. What this really says, though, you dig into it, is that to understand what the curvature function and the torsion function is for a curve is to completely understand the geometry of the curve. So if I wanted to check whether two curves were like congruent in the sense of high school geometry, you can prove that that's only going to be the case if you can, find, if you can parameterize both of them with respect to arc length and they have matching curvature and torsion functions. So we can, we can categorize the geometry of curves by studying the curvature and the torsion. So, oh, so what, what, is, what, is, what is the torsion for this curve? Just let me just finish that and I'm almost done. What's B prime? For our example, while we're at it. Can you differentiate it? What do you got? My, uh, well, not minus, just M alpha squared cosine alpha S, right? Minus, well, plus M alpha squared sine alpha s. Oh, derivative of a constant, zero. So what's, what's, uh, what's b prime dot n then equal to? Because the torsion, remember, is defined to be b prime dot n, so I have to take the dot product with the normal, which I think I erased. Oh, no, phew, it was close. <laughs> it's here. <laughs> Here's the normal. So take the dot product of this with that, what do you get? minus m alpha squared, and then cosine squared plus sine squared, right? So what we have is minus m alpha squared. Now, but remember that the, this is, the torsion is what then? The torsion is m alpha squared, which is what? So 
So there you go, that's the torsion. Now let me just stop and smell the roses for a second here. The curvature was what? It was r divided by m squared plus r squared, right? So this is a helix. Let's think about some special cases real quick while we've got it. So um, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to go back to the T because I, I don't want to write all the other thing out. What happens, this is before I reparameterized it, right? What, happen, what, what does this mean if m is equal to 0? What, what, what does the helix become? Circle. What, what happens to the torsion in the case that m is equal to 0? It's 0, right. That's generally true. If you want to describe when a curve is planar, it simply means that the torsion is 0. The torsion being 0 pretty much means that the binormal is constant. Okay? The, on the other hand, how would you get this kind of, um, let's see here, that's a circle. Uh, let's see here. Oh, what's the curvature in that case? When m is equal to 0, what's this become? 1 over r. And that shows you what the curvature is about. It's like if you fit a circle to the curve, um, the curvature is going to give you 1 over the radius of the, of the circle, which is just fitting to the curve locally. Anyway, I need another 10, 15 minutes to fully describe, but we'll do that next week. So thanks. <laughs>